Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome to this week's video sermon. Listen, I hope that right now you've got a Bible and something to take notes with because I am so excited to study God's Word with you. Life is made up of decisions. You decide what time you're going to wake up in the morning. When your alarm goes off, you make a decision. Am I going to get up or am I going to snooze? Once your alarm goes off, you have a decision to make. Am I going to lay in bed looking at Instagram for 20 minutes or am I going to get up and read the word? You make a decision about what you're going to have for breakfast. You decide what you're going to wear for the day. You decide what you're going to do during the day. And following Jesus is filled with decisions. When temptation comes, you decide to stand strong or to give in. When you have an opportunity to evangelize, you decide to speak up or to be quiet. When you feel worried, you decide to pray or to be anxious. And the Bible is filled with stories of men and women just like you and me who made decisions. That's what Hebrews chapter 11 is. It's a list of people who decided to live by faith. So grab your Bible and turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11, because today we're going to learn from Moses, the decision maker. Now, before we study Moses, there's an important distinction that we need to make. You and I decide to live our lives by faith, not to earn salvation, but rather because we are saved. See, when I wake up in the morning and I decide to read my Bible, I don't do that so I can go to heaven. No, the only reason why I'm going to heaven is because Jesus Christ died on the cross for all of my sins and rose from the grave three days later. But now I live in response to what Jesus has done for me. Every day I decide to live by faith because of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. I don't do it perfectly, but I press on towards that goal. So as we study Moses, we're going to see how saving faith impacts our daily decisions in three areas. In the area of fear, friends, and the future. Follow along in Hebrews chapter 11 as I begin reading in verse 23. By faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents, because they saw the child was beautiful, and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood, so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them. By faith the people crossed the Red Sea as on dry land, but the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. The first area of our lives we're going to see how saving faith impacts our daily decisions is in fear. Write this down for point number one. Decide faith, not fear. Now right away you might be thinking to yourself, what do you mean decide faith, not fear? Fear is a feeling. I can't just decide faith over fear, but let's talk about the difference between feeling fear and responding in fear. I see this in my son all the time. Our next door neighbor has a dog and it's currently my son's obsession. I mean, it feels like every waking moment Weston is saying, dog, dog. When I take him outside to see the dog, as the dog approaches, you can see the feeling of fear rising within my son. I mean, that dog, It scares him, but he has a decision to make. What is he gonna do with those feelings of fear? Is he gonna run away in fear, or is he gonna step forward in faith? And in the same way, you can decide to act in faith 
not fear. Look back at verse 23 with me. It says, By faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents, because they saw that the child was beautiful, and they were not afraid of the king's edict. Now this story takes us all the way back to the book of Exodus. In Exodus chapter 1, the Israelites are multiplying greatly in Egypt. And Pharaoh, he started to get afraid that the Israelites would win if there was a war. And so he came up with a plan to ruthlessly force the Israelites to work as slaves. But still, God multiplied them. And so Pharaoh, he came up with another plan. And he commanded the Hebrew midwives to kill any male child that was born from an Israelite woman. But the Hebrew midwives, they feared God more than Pharaoh. So they didn't listen to him. They let the children live. And still, God multiplied the Israelites. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, saying, Every son that is born to the Hebrews you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. Well, in Exodus chapter 2, a Hebrew baby boy named Moses is born. And his mom doesn't want to throw her baby boy into the Nile River, so she hides him for three months. Well, eventually she realizes as this child grows that she can no longer keep him hidden in her house, and so she makes a basket out of papyrus reeds. And she creates a new hiding spot for him, and she goes and she camouflages him in the river. Well, his sister is snooping on this whole scene from a distance in some of the reeds, and she sees the daughter of Pharaoh. And the daughter of Pharaoh finds the basket, opens it up, and sees Moses in there, and he's a crying baby boy. Well, emerging from her hiding spot in the banks of the river, Moses' sister says to Pharaoh's daughter, do you want me to find a nurse to help you raise this child? And Pharaoh's daughter, it says, has pity on the boy. And so she says, yes. And Moses' sister goes back to Moses' mother. And Moses' mother gets to raise Moses as her child. Well, here's what you have to understand about this whole story. Disobedience to a Pharaoh would have been punished by immediate death. Moses' parents were risking their lives by preserving Moses' life. So the question that we've got to ask ourselves is why in the world would they do such a thing? And the reason why is because they decided not to be afraid of the king. They were willing to disobey the king even if it meant their death. And Hebrews 11 tells us why. It was faith that drove their decision-making, not fear. So let me ask you, how do you make your decisions? Do you make your decisions out of fear or out of faith? Look at what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 10, beginning in verse 26. So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed, or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops, and do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. And man, that is a countercultural command. You are supposed to be an echo of Jesus. You're supposed to take what you've heard and shout it so other people can hear it. You're not supposed to be your own voice in this world. You're just supposed to repeat what you've already heard Jesus say. And maybe you heard Jesus' words in a dark church room. Or maybe you heard Jesus' words whispered to you in a one-on-one -on -one meeting from a faithful brother or a sister who loved you and cared about you. But whatever it was, if you heard the words of Jesus, you're now supposed to be an echo shouting what you've heard so other people can hear it. 
And that's not what our world wants. That's why it's countercultural. Because our world wants you to be your own voice. But Jesus is calling you to something different. And if you do what Jesus is calling you to here, people might not kill you for it, but I can guarantee you they won't like you for it. Man, when you hear that, does that scare you? Here's the question that I really want you to think about with me. Does it scare you so much that it changes the decision that you make to obey what Jesus is calling you to do? That right there is fear. When you hear this call, you need to make your decision on how you will respond by faith and not by fear. And Jesus makes it clear in this passage what will give you faith. Sparrows. What? Did he just say sparrow? Huh? What's a sparrow? Sparrows are small birds. In biblical times, they were a cheap food for poor people. They were actually the cheapest of birds to be sold for food. Their value was a penny. Yet even still, Jesus says, there is not a single sparrow who dies and falls to the ground without God knowing about it. See, so here's something that you have to know. Nothing in God's world is outside of his control or concern. And if you think that God's knowledge of valueless birds is impressive, he knows how many hairs you have on your head. I mean, why don't you today try to count your hairs? Like seriously, go, try to do it. See, uh, uh, unless you're bald, you won't be able to. But God knows. He already knows exactly how many you have on your head. And you are far more valuable than many sparrows. See, it is God's knowledge of you and value for you that increases your faith, which means that you need to feed your faith and not your fear. Here's what you have to understand, and this is so important. Whichever one you feed will grow. And you feed your fear by thinking about what people think about you. Oh man, is that person like me? Oh man, will that person still want to be my friend if I really do go and echo the words of Jesus? See, every time you think those thoughts, it's like dinner time for your fear. And the bigger your fear gets, the harder it will become for you to make decisions by faith. Which is why you need desperately to feed your faith instead of your fear. And you feed your faith by feasting on the word of God. And the more you feast, the greater your faith. So the second area of our lives where we're going to see how saving faith impacts our daily decisions is in the area of friends. Look at what it says back in verse 24. Are you still there with me in Hebrews chapter 11? Oh, come on. Let me hear you. Are you there with me? All right, let's look together at verse 24. It says, by faith Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. Write this down for point number two. Decide the people of God, not the pleasures of sin. Moses had a choice. Who was he going to be friends with? The people of God or the Egyptians? And if he chose the Egyptians, well, that would have been sin for him. It would have been him being unequally yoked. And listen to what the scripture says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? See, in the same way that Moses had to choose who were going to be his friends, you do as well. And the scripture says very clearly, don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. In other words, don't make non-Christians your closest friends. Now, right away, that might sound harsh. That might sound judgmental. That might even sound unloving to you. But it's not. It's biblical. Bad company corrupts good morals. Show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Who you hang with is who you become. 
See, it's so much easier for someone to pull you down into sin than for you to pull them up into righteousness. But not only are all of those things true, but even more than all of that, you are one of God's people. And listen to what it goes on to say in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Look at verse 16. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord. And touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you. And I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. And you are one of God's people. He has placed his spirit inside of you, which makes you a temple, the dwelling place of God Almighty. God lives inside of you. So you have a choice to make. Who am I going to be friends with? The people of God or the fleeting pleasures of sin? Now here's something that you have to know. Sin always brings pleasure. But the pleasure that sin brings will always be fleeting and met with consequences. When you go with those friends and you gossip, it will feel good in the moment, but eventually it will flee away. When you go with those friends and hit that vape, it will feel good in the moment, but eventually it will flee away. When you go with those friends and you make crude jokes, it will feel good in the moment, but eventually it will flee away. So again, you have a choice. And you're going to face this choice on a daily basis. Be mistreated with the people of God or enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. Moses chose to be mistreated with the people of God. What will you choose? I want to show you two details that I love about this section in Hebrews chapter 11. In verse 25, it says, Moses was mistreated with the people of God. Can you underline that word with? See, here's something that you've got to know. You are not alone in your suffering. As a matter of fact, there was only one person to ever be alone in their suffering, and that was Jesus Christ. See, for the six hours that he hung on the cross, God the Father in that moment turned his back on the Son and left him to suffer. This was why on the cross, Jesus cried out and said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because he was suffering alone. But since then, no one has ever suffered alone. I know that, that, that you might feel like it. You might feel alone during this season of self-isolation. But on that cross, Jesus, he purchased the capital C church, not the lowercase c church. And there's a difference between the two. There's a difference between the capital C church and the lowercase C church. See, when, see, no pun intended. When I say the word church, what does your mind go to? Your mind probably goes to Compass HB. But did you know that Compass HB is a lowercase c church? It's a local gathering of God's people. But the capital C church is what Jesus died to purchase. It's all of God's people throughout all of time. So while you might be alone in your house and Compass HB cannot gather together, Compass HB is not the church. There are brothers and sisters throughout the world suffering for Jesus Christ and you get to share in those sufferings with them. Listen to what it says in 1 Peter chapter 5 verses 8 through 9. Be sober minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, he prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the whole world. If you choose the people of God, you will never be alone. The second detail that I love about this section in Hebrews chapter 11 is what it says in verse 26. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth, underline those two words right there, than the treasures of Egypt, 
for he was looking to the reward. Suffering for Christ is a greater wealth than any worldly treasure because in suffering, Jesus becomes real to you. Even now in the coronavirus, my knowledge of the truth, of what God has said in his word, my relationship with Jesus, has become so much more than just knowledge to me. It's become, it's become real because I found myself really needing it during this time. Do you consider even suffering for Christ a greater wealth than any treasure you could have? This week, go and read Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 11 to see how the Apostle Paul, he considered everything as loss compared to the gain of knowing Christ. And the third area of our lives where we're going to see how saving faith impacts our daily decisions is in the future. Look at what it says in Hebrews chapter 11, back in verse 27. Oh, wait, sorry. Are you still there with me? Oh, come, come on, guys. Let me hear you. Are you still there with me? All right, look at what it says in verse 27. It says, By faith he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood, so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them. And by faith the people crossed the Red Sea as on dry land, but the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, they were drowned. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. And by faith, Rahab the prostitute, she did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. See, Moses, he decided. He decided to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt and through the, the Red Sea. Joshua, he decided. He decided to lead the people of Israel in marching around the walls of Jericho until they fell down. And Rahab, she decided. She decided to hide the spies who were scouting out the land. All of those decisions we just read about, Moses, Joshua, and Rahab, all of those decisions that they made greatly impacted the future of Israel. See, it was because these men and women decided to obey God when he called them that the future of Israel was greatly impacted and they were able to go into the promised land of Canaan. And in the same way, the decisions that you make right now are going to impact where you go and who you are in the future. And man, it's so easy, if we're just going to be honest, to always think about the future, to be consumed with thoughts about the future. But you need to decide, what am I going to focus on? The future or what God is calling me to do? right now. And the scripture actually teaches us that the best plan for your future is obedience in the present. Write this down for point number three. Decide obedience now, not future now. And man, if there's one thing that the coronavirus should teach us, it's that the future is uncertain. I mean, who thought a month ago that the rest of the academic year of school would be canceled and everybody would be doing online school. I mean, who thought a month ago that we would all be quarantined in our homes for the next month? No, nobody did. So, so here's a question that we've got to think through. How do we think about the future? One extreme that we can fall into is not planning for the future at all. We can say Christianese kind of things like, oh, well, God... He's in control. He's going to work out his will for my life. And you make no plans and no goals for your future. But oftentimes what that can actually be is unwise and a bad steward of the time that God has given you. The other extreme that sometimes we can fall into is to try and take your future into your own hands and try to grind really, really hard right now so you can control the outcome of what you want for your future. So how do we as Christians make plans for our future in a biblical, wise, and God-honoring way? Listen to what it says in James chapter 4, verse 13. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Or another way that you could read that verse is, Come now, you who say, today or next year, I'm going to go to this school and I'm going to study this thing. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. 
what is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. See, there is a kind of planning that is wrong. It's called presumptuous planning. Because the scripture says that the future is uncertain. I mean, not only do we not know what's going to happen to us four years from now, we don't even know what's going to happen to us four days from now, let alone even four minutes from now. So then how do we make our plans for the future with it being so uncertain? Here's something that I want you to write down. Make your plans according to God's will, but then leave your plans in God's will. So think about what God's will is and plan your future accordingly, but then leave that plan in the will of God and take it one step of obedience at a time. And there's five things that the scripture clearly tells us are God's will. God's will is for you to be saved. God's will is for you to be spirit-filled. God's will is for you to be sanctified. God's will is for you to be submissive. And God's will is for you to suffer. So you need to make your plans for the future according to that list. I mean, just think to yourself, what could I do in the future that would go in line with God's will? Okay, once you've got that plan, go for it but then leave that plan up to God's will. And if he directs your steps somewhere else, you need to be ready to follow him outside of your comfort zone. So let's just summarize and review everything that we've learned here today. Saving faith impacts our daily decisions in three areas. We're gonna decide faith, not fear. We're gonna decide the people of God, not the pleasures of sin. And we're gonna decide obedience now, not future now. Now grab your Bible and turn with me to Joshua chapter 24. Here at the end of Joshua, are you reading Joshua with us at our church? Are you on team Joshua? Come on, let's go. Let's read Joshua every day. Let's watch the scripture of the day YouTube videos. Let's leave comments. Let's interact with one another. Now here at the end of Joshua, the people of Israel, they're in the promised land. And so Joshua gathers them all together and listen what Listen to what Joshua says in chapter 24. Begin with me in verse 14. He says, Now therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Today, you need to choose. What are you going to decide? And to end this sermon, I wanna share some praise reports. Can I bring you some praise reports? Now, let me just ask you, has it felt like during this season of the coronavirus, like God's not really working? Hey, I want to tell you that even when you can't see it, he's working. Even when you can't feel it, he's working. Just this past week, that's right, during quarantine, during a time of self-isolation, we've had two different high school students profess repentance and faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. If I had the Jesus saves flag, it would be waving because Jesus is saving. I mean, isn't that a good report? That God is a way maker. He's a miracle worker. He's the light in the darkness. So now I'm going to ask you, in this time where you're by yourself, where you're all alone, what will you decide? Hey, I love you guys. I hope that you'll join a digital small group on Thursday night. 